and uh, let me say in beginning that my talk is primarily meant for our residents because when SK told me that it's a CME, so I prepared it accordingly. So I hope the senior members will not feel offended when I say something in a direct, didactic manner that don't do it and so understand that it means that usually we should not do it. Okay, so this is the basic aim of any valvular surgery to provide competent valve without physiological significant obstruction. The word is just pay attention on this word physiological significant obstruction. So, what is that physiological significant obstruction? How do we define that when we uh, replace a valve? So, what would define a significant physiological obstruction? So, people have done some studies and they uh, recorded the gradients across the transplanted valve. And then they found that as the index effective orifice area was decreasing, there was a cutoff. This 0.85, that when the index effective orifice area was less than 0.85 centimeter square per meter square, the gradient would rise sharply. And similar finding was noticed during exercise also. So more or less 0.85 centimeter square per meter square effective orifice area became our cutoff figure. So for the young, my young colleagues, I don't want to confuse. So would explain the terms, whatever I'm using, what is effective orifice area? The blood does not pass through whole of the prosthetic valve. This prosthetic valve has got a housing. So whatever is the area, in this case, this yellow area inside the housing is geometric orifice area, but the blood doesn't passes through whole of the geometric orifice area. Then if we remove the valve mechanism, the leaflet starts and everything. So whatever is remaining of the geometric orifice area becomes clear orifice area. But in physiological state, when the blood is flowing through this orifice, it does not occupy the whole of the clear orifice area. Because of the hemodyne, uh, the rheological properties of the blood, the blood does not occupy it completely. So only part of the orifice which is occupied by the blood during physiological state is the our effective orifice area. Now you can see we started with yellow this much, but finally we landed with this red. So the effective orifice area may be 70% to 90% of the geometric orifice area through which blood actually passes. So this is of our concern. So if index effective orifice, index mean the effective orifice area of the valve has been divided by the BSA, body surface area of the patient in meter square. If index effective orifice area is less than 0.85 centimeter square per meter, per meter square, the prosthesis is considered obstructive and it's called patient prosthesis mismatch. A clinical and practical definition, if the Prosthetic valve behaves like a moderately or severely stenotic valve, then it is a patient prosthesis mismatch. And for people who believe in patient prosthesis mismatch, it's an important clinical consideration and it impacts this long term survival adversely. There are some people who don't believe it, but my talk is focused only for believers. And PPM becomes more relevant when we need higher cardiac output, especially in young patients, in athletes, 
where we need more cardiac output. And similarly, if the heart is not able to tolerate distal obstruction, whatever may be the magnitude, PPM becomes important. So if LV dysfunction is there, then also PPM becomes important. So now let's come to the small aortic root. How do we define small aortic root? People have used different definitions that if the annular size is this much, if the prosthesis size is this much, nothing would fit. A single parameter cannot define small aortic root. For example, if you say 25 millimeter of annulus, it may sound large for you, but think of a patient and uh, a patient with a BSA of 2.2, this 25 may be small for him. Then a young athlete of 25 year, a 23 millimeter annulus may appear small to me. And in contrast, if an 80 year old person is there, who is more or less living a sedentary life, 23 so may sound good to me. So small aortic root or PPM cannot be defined in isolation. So this is for th just theoretical consideration. PPM has been graded as moderate and severe. Moderate if the index effective orifice area is between 0.6 to 0.85 centimeter square and severe if it's less than 0.65 centimeter square. But when we put definition in terms of number, we should uh, take into consideration about the obesity also. If person is obese, then the cardiac output does not increase in proportion to the BSA. So for obese pa patient in whom BMI is more than 30 kg per meter square, there is a change in the definition of PPM. Moderate is less than 0.7 centimeter square and severe is less than 0.5 square centimeter. So when I was talking about definition of small aortic root, a small aortic root is an interaction between the anatomy. Anatomy means the annular size. I gave you an example. The body size, the a say five feet tall Indian woman of 40 kg. For her, the annular size and PPM would be different than a large person of 2.2 uh, meter square area. So the body size is also an important consideration. Then the physiological condition, as I gave you an example of what is the physiological requirement of the cardiac output. And of course, what prosthesis are you going to use? If you are going to use a bad prosthesis, everybody will have PPM. If you are going to use a good prosthesis, maybe you can eliminate PPM. So whenever we define small aortic root, it should be a combination of the endless size, body size, physiological condition, and the prosthesis which we are going to use. So in decision making also, we consider all these factors by which we can prevent PPM. So management of small aortic root is essentially prevention of PPM. Before I go for prevention of PPM, just for, uh, for clarity of thoughts, I would introduce some very basic terminology. terminology. Implantation technique, we can implant a valve in the aortic annulus in three manners. This one, the whole of the valve, including the suture ring, goes inside the annulus. This is intra-annular implantation. In this one, the metal housing goes inside the annulus, but the suture ring remains above the annulus. This is supra-intra implantation. Third one, the whole of the metal housing and the suture ring remains above the annulus. This is supra-annular replacement. This thing has an important bearing. I will explain when I come 
to these things down the line. Then the suturing technique is also important. You see this A, B, and D. These are placing the valve intraannularly. Only C technique, this technique C, that is mattress suture with loop or pledge on the ventricular side, is putting the valve in supraannular position. So when we are talking about a small aortic root, we have to just focus on this technique. So we should know how to take sutures for supraannular placement of the valve. Because we may choose a prosthesis which is meant for supraannular placement and then we choose this technique of everting matter suture which places the valve intraannularly. Your life will be very difficult. You won't be able to put that prosthesis inside the annulus. Now, it is important to know the valve also. This is a prosthetic valve in which we can focus on two components. This is the metal housing which we see and this is the suture ring. Metal housing and the suture ring. Inner one is not relevant as far as my talk is concerned. So suture ring and metal housing. In bioprosthetic valve, again, this stent, this is stent and then the suture ring. So when we tell about these valves, we should remember these dimension. What is this? IOD, internal orifice diameter. Not much of relevance for surgeon, only for assessment of the value. This tissue annulus diameter. Tissue annulus diameter is the, this diameter is important because actually this is the label size of the valve. And secondly, this will come in touch with the annulus. For all practical purpose, if you are going for a supra annular implantation, then your this will be the line of demarcation where the valve should touch the native tissue. And then this is external suture ring diameter. This is the diameter of the suture ring. If you are putting the valve in intra annular manner, then this suture ring goes inside the annulus. So the space required should include, uh, should have consideration for this suture ring also. So in intraannular placement and supraannular placement, both are different thing and sizing is also done differently and they have different connotation. For coming to a bioprosthesis, we have internal diameter. That means internal diameter of the stent Outer diameter of the stent is also called tissue annulus diameter. This is relevant for us. And of course, external suture ring diameter, which is no brainer, all of us understand it. Another word which we will be using in this talk is performance index of a valve. Performance index is the measure of efficiency of a valve. How efficient is the valve or how non obstructive is the valve? And performance index is the ratio of effective orifice area divided by tissue annulus area. That means we have just learned what is tissue annulus diameter. So if we calculate the tissue annulus area, basically tissue annulus area is the area which is required to place the valve in supraannular position. So if we divide effective orifice area by tissue annulus area, we will get the performance index. So higher the performance index, better is the valve, more efficient is the valve, less obstructive is the valve. So prevention of PPM, let's take stepwise manner. Plan surgery. If on eco, if we uh, find that the annulus is small, we should order for a CT NGO. I see two things on CT NGO. Aortic annulus is usually elliptical. It's not rounded. And on eco, eco cuts the aortic, the LVOT plane in sagittal section, sagittal plane. And usually it is the smaller diameter of LVOT and aortic annulus. The larger diameter we can see in the coronal sections, 
eco cannot provide us so a ct ngo will give you a better definition of the size of the iot canvas and secondly lvot can also be seen on ct ngo if we find any muscle hypertrophy in aortic stenosis patient with smaller lvot in at least 10% of the cases you will find that the muscle is bulging in subvalvular plane which may produce gradient in post operative period then second thing is use valves with higher pi now comes performance index part i told that we have to use more efficient valve thirdly avoid pledgets maybe most of us uh, most of you will not agree but i don't use pledgets so i i always say that pledgets rather are enemy of the surgeon now you see that this is the endless which is available to us and these are three technique of valve insertion this violet is where the blood is flowing so larger the violet area we know that the more area is available for flow of blood same annulus in this one intra annular because suturing is also inside the annulus we see that this violet area is small supra intra somewhere in between but if you place the same valve in supra annular manner we see that there is large violet area same annulus but now we are getting more orifice through which blood can flow the currently available valve in india i am not talking uh, globally but what are whatever the valves are available i will just touch on those so high performance index mechanical valve intra supra annular st jude region onex and miltonia ap not miltonia routine miltonia standard is uh, intra annular valve so it will not give us high pi miltonia ap is supra intra valve and st jude region is the valve uh, market leader then purely supra annular presently in indian market we have one mechanical valve that is bicarbon overline onex whatever may be the cuff design but the implantation technique is supra intra annular you can see the effective orifice area even for a 19 size valve is quite good 1.5 that mean if we insert a 19 onex valve up to a bsa of 1.7 1.6 there won't be any ppm and 21 effective orifice area is 1.8 so overall onex is a good valve miltonia ap you see 20 size valve has got an effective orifice area of 1.7 which is fairly big bicarbon overline the 20 size valve has got an effective area of 2 square cm again very efficient valve regent the regent is the most efficient valve available in the market at present a 21 size has got the effective orifice area of 2 square cm don't get confused regent with uh, other sendude valves St Jude in India, they are presently marketing three type of St Jude: St Jude Master, that is standard valve, not old one; St Jude Master series, then St Jude Master HP High Performance, and finally Regent. If you see this green color, green or blue, this designates the area of blood flow, and it is maximum in case of Regent. and we can see that at 21 it has got an effective orifice area of about 2 square cm which is sufficient up to a bsa of 2.2 at 2.2 this is in green so we can be sure that the 21 st jude is good enough for all these patients now coming to the tissue valve in market we are got uh, three tissue valves available which are which have got high performance index and these tissue valves are always implanted supraannular in supraannular fashion if we implant intraannularly we will be able to put only very small valve magna is all of us are very familiar with magna each a 21 size 
gives effective orifice area of 1.9 square centimeter. Another addition by the Edward group is Inspiris Rigelia. The hemodynamic features are almost similar. This is a dry valve. It doesn't require any preservative. The, this chart is similar to that of Edwards Magna. But the important difference is that this valve can be dilated in future when we are going for valve in valve implantation. This, the stent is designed in such a way that they are overlapping plates. And when you dilate with the help of a balloon, these plates move away from each other and we can achieve at least one size larger orifice inside where we can put it, uh, the tivy part. The Make in India daffodil, this is less efficient than Magna, but still better than other valves which were being used till recently in the country. Another group of high performance tissue valves include sutureless valve. These are recent addition in which you see that the, there is a stent, the expendable stent is there which goes inside the annulus. So the valve, this prosthetic material which occupies the annulus is very minimal. So we get a better flow if we use a sutureless valve for the same annulus. For example, if you see this one, this is uh, in this one, a 23 in duty has been used in this one, 23 magna has been used. So the turbulence with the magna is grossly perceptible, but in duty is not available in India. This valve is available in India, Percival. So, of all the available bioprosthesis, Percival is the largest effective orifice area for a given size. For 21 size annulus, if we see the available valve area, effective orifice area may reach up to 2.2 square centimeters. So, it's very efficient valve. But the drawbacks with the sutureless valve is that very high incidence of complete heart block because there is a, this stent, the expanding mechanism compresses upon the conduction system and patients may land in complete heart block. Various reports have reported from 10% to 25% of complete heart block after using these sutureless valves. So when one is going for it, one should be careful about it. So once we have understood the hardware and all these things, how to proceed? Simple thing, I will just enumerate the steps. First, decide what patient is going to require mechanical or bioprosthesis, then calculate the BSA of the patient, calculate the required effective orifice area for that patient, that is 0.85 multiplied by BSA. There are ready-made tables available, so there is no need of doing multiplication. Then select a prosthesis which has got an effective orifice area more than the required effective orifice area. So suppose if our uh, required effective orifice area comes 1.5, so our prosthesis should provide us an effective orifice area 1.5 or greater. Each uh, these manufacturer supplies this chart. You whatever prosthesis you are using, you can procure this chart and hang in your operation room and can decide which one. For example, if this patient has got a BSA of 1.7 and if I see this is coming here, that means if I am going to use this prosthesis, this model of prosthesis, I will need a 23 size prosthesis because if I use a smaller 21, it will be red. That means patient will have patient prosthesis mismatch. So this is a very simple algorithm which we follow. Now, see the tissue analysis diameter of the selected prosthesis. Usually, it is the label size. Again, tissue analysis diameter is the label size. Then, minimum diameter required of the annulus is tissue analysis diameter required plus 2. And, annulus diameter, we 
have the value in front of us. If our annulus diameter is less than the required diameter, patient will go for annular enlargement. If annulus diameter is more than the required diameter, we simply choose the, our processes and put it in place. So this was about the need for the uh, root enlargement. The steps may appear little complicated, but it's very simple if you follow this. There is nothing big about it. You see what diameter you are going to require. If it's the endless is less than that, go for a root enlargement. Another uh, indication for root enlargement in current scenario is that if we are going to put a bioprosthesis in a middle-aged person, suppose 60, 65 year, who is otherwise healthy, who is a future candidate of TAVI. That means we are making a platform for future valve in valve. So in this patient, it has been realized that the valve is less than 23 millimeter. The internal orifice of the valve is less than 23 millimeter. Then there will be problem of future PPM when we are going for valve in valve. So people recommend it that if you are preparing a platform for valve in valve, then we should have at least 23 sides of the valve. Or if we are going for Inspiris, which can be dilated, expanded in future, we can go for a 20 size, 21 size valve. This will give us a good platform to insert a sizable valve at second intervention. Uh, root replacement, I think I will just show uh, two videos quickly rather than talking about these things. Anterior uh, root enlargement and posterior root enlargement. By posterior root enlargement, usually we get a size increase on one to two valve sides, whereas anterior root enlargement, we can gain up to three size increase. The most popular one is going through the between the commissure of non-coronary and left coronary sinus, which what we call manugian. I will just show up now quickly some video. Okay, now this aortotomy incision has been extended in between the commissure of the left and non-coronary sinus. This uh, this commissure it, we have gone into the aortomital curtain. We have not gone up to the AML. If we go up to ML, we will have to open the left atrium also. I use this graph, Decton graph, because it's available and there's no problem of sizing and handling. So we suture this. And while suturing, you would notice that I take the adventitia of the LA also. I take the left atrium also so that I don't have to put a patch to cover the left atrium. while putting these sutures be meticulous because the, the suture line becomes inaccessible and if it starts bleeding, it will be very difficult to control from outside. After reaching here, we stop, we interrupt the suture and then we take the valve sutures. Valve suture for supra placement, as I mentioned earlier, Sizing, we are taking the valve suture. This is the transition zone. The native endless, once we have taken the 
sutures from the native annulus, we come to the patch. And in transition zone, we take one bite in the native annulus, another bite on the patch. Now these sutures are placed through the patch from outside. These are proline sutures. We got polyester sutures will make big hole in the graft, which will keep on oozing. After putting these four proline sutures, we pass these through the valve, which we have selected, lower down the valve, tie the sutures, and then extend this graft as a patch on the autotomy. Don't uh, terminate this patch very in a short fashion. Just take this patch along the whole autotomy. Otherwise, that area will become crumpled and it will bleed. So we take this patch along the whole aortotomy. You can see this, it will reach to the it will, this patch will cover the whole layout. I'll show another small video of a Kono procedure. Sharing new or is key. Huh? नहीं नहीं वो जूम से जो शेयर करने की कोशिश कर रहे हैं वो नहीं हो रहा होगा दिस इज अ 7 ईयर ओल्ड बॉय हु हैज गॉट दिस असेंडिंग एओटा एंड डिस्टल असेंडिंग एओटा डायलेटेशन विद सीवियर एओटिक स्टेनोसिस द एओटिक एनालिसिस इज ओनली 14 मिलीमीटर सो वी डिसाइडेड टू डू ए बेंटाल एंड हेमियास रिप्लेसमेंट आफ्टर एनलार्जिंग द एनालिसिस विद Kono procedure. So this is left button is being developed. Right button is being developed. Now two stage switches are placed on the aortic endless where we want to cut it. In this area, underlying will be interventricular septum. This stay suture just help you to cut precisely and uh, your assistant is a little relaxed. First, we enter in RVOT, make a small nick and see where the pulmonary valve is there. Once we are sure about the position of the pulmonary valve, we increase the incision. Now we are cutting in the interventricular septum. We go on measuring intermittently till our this ventriculotomy is sufficient to take up the desired valve. Probably this is the only suture line where I use plagiated suture. So, The plagiated sutures are placed along the whole V length of the ventriculotomy. A pericardial patch is selected. Sutures are passed through the pericardial patch. And then pericardial patch is lowered and tied. This will be the first layer of ventriculotomy closure.
Now with thioproline suture, I always place another running suture so that there is no question of development of a VSD or suture cut through. And once we reach angle, we interrupt this suture. Now, after selecting the appropriate size valve, we put these valve switches. In this condition, in this case, we have gone from out of the aortic endless and come inside. Here we take uh, these valve suture through the pericardium. The patch, some people use a piece of graft here, but I will use the same patch to cover the RVOT. That's why I have used pericardium. In isolated cono, uh, inside we use a prosthetic graft and outside we put a pericardial patch. So now the suture placement is complete. The appropriate size conduit is selected. We pass the suture through this well conduit. Conduity lower and tight. Now this is the second layer of suture. This proximal suture line, I take a thioproline and in over and over running suture will cover it. This suture line is really hemostatic. We suture the pericardial patch also for this purpose of second layer of suture. Once we have placed this layer of suturing, there are very less chances that this proximal suture line will bleed. So once this suture line is complete, we cover up the right ventriculotomy part. In a running fashion, big needle, 3O, 25mm needle. <laughs> On the other side, the same thing we run over and complete the one should take precaution that while closing, one should not compromise with RVOT. So one should be a little liberal with the patch. Some redundant patch will not harm, but if we use a small patch, RVOT will be narrowed. So after putting this, the routine part of the bental and hemi-RC placement, which I have not included in this uh, clip or video. And this is the final picture. Thank you.